The Stanley Cup playoffs are a two-month grind unlike anything else in professional sports. Players have trained for decades and put everything on the line for a chance to just once in their life hoist the world's most coveted trophy, a century-old relic etched with the names of the NHL legends who have raised it themselves. But from the mid-90s into the early aughts, teams were met with a challenge that even John Wick would call an impossible task. A final boss who showed no mercy for even the game's most respected stars, Scott Stevens. And no, this video isn't just a hits montage or the same old debate over whether or not he played dirty. His mark on the NHL, especially during the playoffs, transcends the evolution of the rules and the role of the shutdown defenseman. You see, it wasn't just Hall of Famers like Paul Correa, Ron Francis, and Eric Lindros who felt the overwhelming force of Stevens' hits in the most crucial moments of their careers. It was entire 20-man teams. These are the five Stanley Cup runs that were wrecked by Scott Stevens. I want to give some proper context first, as Stevens played in a different era. After all, the bruising, grinding brand of hockey from 25 or 30 years ago is quite different from the faster, flashier game that we enjoy today. Stevens unrelentingly delivered punishing hits because they were still largely accepted at the time, albeit not by everyone. As long as he initiated contact with his shoulder instead of his elbow and kept his feet on the ice going into the hit, he'd be applauded for doing his job. Consequently, Stevens was never suspended for any of his body checks. But as with other sports, research and player accounts of concussions influenced the NHL standards and rules. The implementation of the Department of Player Safety and Rule 48 regarding head contact were efforts to cull some of the more dangerous forms of contact. If you want to learn more about the league's evolution, then you can't miss my video on Rafi Torres, who was suspended 74 games over his 13-year NHL career. Alright, now for the good stuff. Just one year prior, the New Jersey Devils were knocking on the door to their first ever Stanley Cup final appearance. They had a young superstar in goal in Martin Brodeur, a deep forward group, and an intimidating defense led by Captain Crunch himself, Scott Stevens. But upon escaping the conference final in a deciding Game 7, the New York Rangers slammed the door shut. At this time, the Devils had been transitioning Stevens from an offensively gifted weapon into the NHL's premier shutdown defenseman. His fearlessness and timing in delivering open ice hits rounded him out as one of the most feared players of his generation. Combining a reinvented Stevens with an aggressive neutral zone trap defense and a world-class goaltender, the Devils had mastered their brand of playoff hockey. They had held opponents to just 27 goals in 16 playoff games en route to the 95 Cup Final. Their opponent, the heavily favored Detroit Red Wings, were on an equally dominant run and seeking their first cup in 40 years. Now a lot of you know the big hit in this series went down in Game 2, but there's something else that we can't overlook. Stevens had made his presence known earlier on. In Game 1, he laid this hit on young centerman Keith Primo, who was nearly a point per game player. Primo went straight to the locker room and missed the next game. The Red Wings struggled to create offensive chances, as the Devils just allowed 17 shots and won 2-1. Now to Game 2. After a scoreless first period, the Wings got on the board first with this power play goal from Slava Kozlov, his team high ninth of the playoffs. He had already scored four game-winning postseason goals, including this series-winning dagger in the conference final against their most bitter rival, the Chicago Blackhawks. Tied 1-1 in the second, Kozlov brought the puck up the wing into the Devils' zone and headed toward the slot when... Detroit back in. Oh! Steven stepped up, nailed him, Brodeur has got the puck, what a shot is that? Kozlov left the game with a concussion. Somehow he played the rest of the series, but didn't register a single point. And if that hit didn't send a message to the Red Wings bench, then Stevens was sure to deliver one himself. He skated over and chirped former Capitals teammate Dino Cicerelli, you're next. The Devils overcame a 2-1 deficit in the third period to win 4-2. Teammate and all-around shit starter Claude Lemieux weighed in after the game. I knew he could score, I knew he could skate, I knew he could do just about anything he wanted on the ice, but the thing I worried about when playing against him was the big hit and how tough he is. I think Detroit thinks about that too. New Jersey eventually completed a four-game sweep in a shocking upset, holding the NHL's third-ranked offense to a total of seven goals. Years later, Devils assistant Larry Robinson reflected. In some ways, the Kozlov hit did reinvent Scott. 
so much of our success in that series was based on that hit, how much confidence it gave us. Fortunately for the Red Wings, the Devils never stood in their way again, as they won three of the next seven cups. New Jersey needed five more years to make another deep run of their own, but once they did, they'd punish their opponents more than ever. This era of NHL hockey gave us several nasty rivalries. Perhaps the most heated was the one between the Red Wings and the Colorado Avalanche. Just say the name Claude Lemieux to Detroit fans, I dare you. A close second was the battles between the Devils and the Philadelphia Flyers, and specifically the clash of the Titans that were Scott Stevens and Eric Lindros. Nicknamed the next one before his drafting, Lindros was a freak of nature, a bulldozing 6'4", 240-pound centerman with a full suite of offensive gifts, and when it came to his matchup with Stevens, one hell of a mean streak. There was rarely a dull moment with both players on the ice, from headbutts to hip checks and a few scraps to boot. Flash forward to the 2000 Eastern Conference Final. The Flyers had home ice but were seen as the underdog as Lindros was still recovering from a concussion. Just like with the Red Wings series in 95, there was that omen before the Big Bang. In Game 2, Stevens leveled another up-and-coming centerman, Damon Lankow. Scott Stevens nailed Damon Lankow, and can Lankow make it off? I'm not sure he knows where he is. Lankow was escorted off the ice and missed the next two games. Even without two of their top five regular season scorers, the Flyers found all the offense they needed to take a 3-1 series lead. And even though the Devils clawed back to force Game 7, Philly could remain hopeful now that 88 was back on the ice. Lindros had thrived throughout his playoff runs, tallying 24 goals and 33 assists in 49 games. With his team down 1-0 in the first period, he collected a Scott Niedermeyer turnover near center ice. Leading the rush, he made perhaps the most crucial mistake when facing the Devils, streaking into the zone with number four on the ice. Here's 88, Lindros makes the move, and Lindros oh! is hammered down on the ice by Scott Stevens. Lindros appeared unconscious even before the back of his head hit the ice. The force was so heavy that even the Devils' Jay Pandolfo fell down. Lindros was done for the series. With a 1-1 tie late in the third period, Patrick Eliash delivered the conference-clinching goal. Fans booed Stevens when he accepted the Prince of Wales trophy, but when asked about the Lindros hit which the ESPN broadcast team deemed clean contact, he voluntarily disclosed. He's reaching for the puck and he sort of lost the puck, so he's down really low. I felt really bad. I had trouble playing the game after that, to be honest with you. I, I hate to see that happen, but I, I really feel bad. The era of Lindros and the Great Legion of Doom teams had come to an end, devoid of a Stanley Cup. It's been nearly half a century since Philly last raised it. This hit, this game, remains the most soul-shattering loss over the last few decades of Philadelphia sports history, wrote Philly Sports website, Section 215. Stevens added insult to injury for Flyers fans with a dominant performance in the final against the defending champion Dallas Stars. He scored the winning goal in Game 1, and he assisted on the cup-clinching mark in overtime of Game 6. Stevens and the Devils had put on a masterclass against the Stars, holding them to just nine goals in six lengthy games. And this time, he raised not only the Cup, but also the Conn Smythe as the MVP of the playoffs. Now, as great of a teammate as Scott Stevens was, I gotta give it up to you guys because in just our fourth month, we eclipsed 1,000 and then 1,500 subscribers. So thank you so much. I'm fired up to see what we can do with this channel and how I can improve the quality of my videos. If you wanna support my work, you can now become a channel member for as little as a dollar a month. Just tap the join button down below for more info. Alternatively, you can leave a one-time donation with the super thanks button. All right, guys, now back to our feature presentation. The next season, Stevens put together arguably his best campaign in quite some time. He finished with his highest point total in seven years, and he was a Norris Trophy finalist for the first time since 94. But even though he was getting into his late 30s, he still valued physicality as part of his game, and boy did he make that known against several skaters in the 01 playoffs. The rampage began in the first round against the Carolina Hurricanes. With just 12 seconds left in Game 2, he drilled 20-goal scorer Shane Willis. But despite missing the rest of the series, Willis credited Stevens for a demolishing but legal play. It wasn't like he took a vicious shot to my head. It was as square of a hit as you could make and not deliberately hitting me in the head. 
The hit may have ruffled some feathers, especially for Hurricanes captain Rod Brindamore and goaltender Arturs Irbe, but Stevens knew he was on the same path that got him to the promised land six years ago. Early in the next game, he ran through another Hall of Famer, 38-year-old Ron Francis. As you can see here, the impact was so seismic for Francis that he couldn't even pick himself up to get back to the bench. That was his last shift in the series. Stevens continued to connect with more unsuspecting skaters, including Craig Adams and Sami Kapanen, who despite the collision, scored the overtime winner in Game 4. The Hurricanes held on a little longer, but fell in six games. There was no answer for a bruising defenseman who couldn't care less if you were none other than Wayne Gretzky himself. Now to the next round, where the Devils squared off against the Toronto Maple Leafs. We'll set the stage with an article from ESPN's Adrian Wojnarowski. Nobody's forgotten. Nobody can stop talking about him. For over a week, Stevens has been the obsession of sports talk radio in Toronto. The obsession of the Leafs themselves. Wojnarowski was largely referring to Stevens' impact on the division semifinal between Jersey and Toronto last year. His shots to players like Corey Cross and Tomas Caverle had influenced how the Leafs retooled their roster that offseason, opting for muscle over skill. Now that series aside, the Devils Maple Leaf saga never had the most notorious of track records. But on a player versus player level, there weren't many beefs at that time that were as juicy as Stevens versus enforcer Ty Domi. Their first memorable clash came during the bench clearing brawl of the 1992 conference final. Domi was never impressed by Stevens' refusal to engage in a proper tilt, later calling him the biggest phony I ever played against. That guy used to target all the best players on my teams, and I always tried to fight him, and he would never fight. He never, ever answered the bell. Well, he's not entirely wrong. Two seasons later, Stevens upended Domi, but turned down the offer to scrap. And in last year's playoffs against the Leafs, Stevens got away with a shot after the whistle. Once again, he declined a tussle. Flash forward to Game 4 in 01. Toronto wasn't even 90 seconds away from tying up the series at two games apiece. Domi wasn't known as a goal scorer, but despite limited minutes potted 13 in the regular season, he had a rare chance to bury one past Martin Berdur, but after the initial save, felt a familiar body shove him down to the ice and throw in some extra shots for good measure. The refs assessed a roughing to Stevens, and with his adversary in the box, Domi saw a rare opportunity for retaliation. And who better to target than Jersey's other Hall of Fame blue liner, Scott Niedermeyer, who threw a hard cross check on him in Game 2. Take a look. Here's Niedermeyer coming along the glass. This is behind the play now. Oh, oh, oh man. boy, no question about Domi that. Domi comes across with the elbow. Niedermeyer left the ice on a stretcher and missed the rest of the series. Domi was assessed a match penalty for intent to injure and subsequently was banned for the remainder of the playoffs. I felt really bad about it, and I felt it took away from something really special that was going on, Domi said upon the suspension. Without Niedermeyer, the Leafs had the Devils on the ropes taking a 3-2 series lead on a last-minute tally in Game 5. But without their enforcer, the Leafs couldn't finish the job. The Devils prevailed in seven games and got within one game of repeating as Stanley Cup champions. Despite the defeat, this Devils core would have one more shot at the ultimate prize. And what a shot it was. In his final full season, Scott Stevens put an exclamation point on his 20-year NHL career helping New Jersey finish with the fewest goals allowed. On to the playoffs. The Devils nearly blew a 3-1 series lead in the conference final against the Ottawa Senators, but with under three minutes left in Game 7, punched their ticket to the Cup Final yet again. Standing in their way was a Mighty Ducks of Anaheim club led by a red-hot Jean-Sebastien Jaguar in goal and top scorer Paul Correa. The teams were tied at two games apiece, but with the help of a Stevens assist in Game 5, New Jersey retook the series and could close it out in six. Korea had already collected two primary assists, helping the Ducks build a 3-1 lead with hopes of forcing Game 7. Gathering a neutral zone turnover, this is already looking eerily familiar, Korea led the charge up ice and flipped the puck to Petr Sikora, and yet he never saw the approaching Stevens from his blind side. Korea lay unconscious for 48 seconds. All I remember is going back to the bench and saying, please get up. That was my feeling, just get up mm -hmm. off the ice. You're, you're scared, you know, absolutely. Korea somehow returned to the game in the same period, and with no Stevens on the ice, answered back in what lives on as one of the game's iconic moments.
While the Ducks won Game 6, Korea, who had 22 more points than any other Duck, was nowhere near 100% for Game 7. In fact, years later, he revealed that he doesn't remember playing in it, or even the finest moment of his Hall of Fame career. The Devils shut down the Mighty Ducks 3-0, with Stevens assisting on the final goal. He hoisted the Stanley Cup for the third time in nine seasons. You know, I played a certain way, and I always felt as much as a big goal or a big block shot could change a game, a hit could do the same thing. All right, check this out, guys. Paul Correa, Eric Lindros, Matt Sundin, Daniel Alfredson, Adam Oates, Pavel Bure, Dino Cicerelli, Cam Neely, Pat LaFontaine, Dale Havercheck. These are all Hall of Famers who never won a Stanley Cup having faced Scott Stevens in the playoffs. Oh yeah, and that was just during his time with the Devils. We often forget that he played a full eight seasons with the Washington Capitals, of course spending a lot of that time in the penalty box, and then he had one year after that in St. Louis before coming over to the New Jersey Devils where he was captain of the team for 12 years. So what do you guys think of Scott Stevens? Over 1,600 games over two decades, 908 career points, 2,785 penalty minutes. He had three Stanley Cups and a Conn Smythe. Let me know in the comments below and shout out any ideas that you have for future videos, whether that's hockey or otherwise. And speaking of hockey, don't forget we have a second channel all about hockey that is Twisted Wrister Hockey, so be sure to check that out if you haven't already. Once again, tap the join button down below to become a member and support my work. Alternatively, you can contribute either through Super Thanks. We also accept PayPal or Venmo. You can just see the video description for more info on that. Hey, thank you so much for watching, guys. I really had a blast producing this one. It was a highly requested topic after our first video on Rafi Torres, and hopefully we have more exciting hockey topics to explore in future videos. I'm Nick, and I'll see you right here next time on Sudden Death Sports.